A 200 kilogram refrigerator is sitting on a sheet of ice. Newton's first law says if there are no net forces acting on this refrigerator, it will stay at rest. Watch what happens when I apply a 50 Newton force to this refrigerator. You can see it starts to move. The speed is increasing. If the speed is increasing, that means there's an acceleration. So I can say if there's a net force applied to an object, it causes an acceleration, which causes a change in speed. Now watch this. I'm starting over and again applying a 50 Newton force to the refrigerator. The acceleration created by this force changes the refrigerator's speed. Now watch what happens if I remove this force. The acceleration disappears but the refrigerator is still moving. Notice though that it's moving at a constant speed. Okay, you're looking at the six step force and torque analysis method. I'm not going to read through it in detail now, but you'll definitely learn this during class, during PAL sessions, and during additional homework sessions. Methods are the engineer's best friend. They represent best practices that you can use to efficiently bring things into focus. The sooner you can bring things into focus, the sooner you can start innovating and coming up with creative solutions. Okay, a force is any push or pull that tends to change the motion of an object. An object's acceleration can only be changed when acted upon by a force. The second bullet is actually relatively new thinking. Up until not too long ago, the thinking was that if you remove the force, the object will come to a stop. Now we know that if you remove the force, the acceleration goes to zero, but the object could continue to move at a constant velocity. Box 2, there are four fundamental forces in the universe, the strong force, weak, gravitational, and electromagnetic forces. Every force that we're going to look at is a manifestation of one or more of these forces. A lot of people think there's actually only one fundamental force, and every force including the four you see here, are just manifestations of this one unified fundamental force. This is where string theory comes into play. Here's a different way to think of mass. Mass is motion stubbornness. The greater the mass, the greater its resistance to having its velocity changed. Another word for motion stubbornness is inertia. Here's a useful mnemonic. As money is to wealth, mass is to inertia. You could say money is the measure of one's wealth and mass is the measure of an object's inertia. Using a hammer, a sponge, a wood block, and a lead brick, let's illustrate one of Newton's laws as I hit each one of these objects with the hammer with the same force. As we could see, as we apply the same force to each, each object, the less massive object flew the farthest, not nearly as far, and hardly moved at all. Watch me apply a 50 Newton force to this box and notice the acceleration equals 1.0 meters per second squared. Now watch me apply the same 50 Newton force to a 200 kilogram refrigerator. The refrigerator has four times the mass as the 50 kilogram box, so its motion stubbornness is four times greater. The result is an acceleration that is one-fourth that of the box, or 0.25 meters per second squared. I talked about Newton's first law. Here's the formal introduction. If no net force acts on a body, the body's velocity can't change. That is, the body can't accelerate. I'm mentioning inertial reference frames here, but not a lot will be done with it in this course. On to Newton's second law. Everyone knows F equals MA. In box number one, let me point out that force is a vector, so you have to worry about magnitude and direction. Also know there's often multiple forces acting on an object. So F subscript net, or the sum of all forces, blends together all of those component forces into a net force. Another really useful takeaway from box one is that the direction of the force vector is always in the same direction as the acceleration vector. That comes in handy a lot of times. Box two, as mentioned multiple times, whenever you have a two-dimensional or three-dimensional vector, your first instinct is to decompose it into component vectors. Once you analyze what's going on with these components, you can blend them back together to get 
get the net result. Box number three introduces the Newton. If you do the dimensional analysis on F equals MA, you see that force is expressed as a kilogram meter per second squared, which is known as the Newton. Here's an example. A 50 Newton force is applied to a 200 kilogram refrigerator. I'll start with F equals MA and rearrange to isolate A, acceleration. So 50 Newtons divided by 200 kilograms equals 0.25 meters per second squared. Newton's third law. In nature, forces always occur in pairs. Any force is always met with an opposite and equal reaction force. You will never ever be able to point to a force that doesn't have an opposite and equal twin. You've heard this before. For every action force, there's an opposite and equal reaction force. This is how rocket engines work. The action force pushes on the rocket fuel, and the reaction force from that rocket fuel pushes on the rocket, and that's how the rocket moves. What we have here is a device we call our fire extinguisher cart. We have a very high pressure fire extinguisher where the safeties have been taken off. We have a sail on the back end, which is what we're going to spray our, our fire extinguisher against. So now I'm going to release all the pressure from my fire extinguisher against the sail and we'll see what happens. So as you could tell, because we had a sail attached to our fire extinguisher cart, all the force was pressed against our sail, so we couldn't move due to Newton's law, third law of motion, which says that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Now we're going to do the same demonstration, but we're going to take the sail off. Now we're going to release the pressure from the fire extinguisher without the sail on the back, and we'll see what happens. Consider two ice skaters pushing off on each other as you see here. Even if their masses were dramatically different, and even if one of the skaters was sitting there passively, the forces that arise when they push off on each other are opposite and equal. Let's look at a few examples. No matter what kind of force we're looking at, it obeys Newton's first, second, and third laws. Box number one, the weight force. Remember, force is a vector, so you have to worry about direction and magnitude. In this case, the direction is straight down towards the center of the Earth. The magnitude is directly related to the object's mass. Box two, the normal force. This is a Newton's third law reaction pair. Keep this visual and description in mind. The normal force is the reaction force of one object to another object in physical contact with it. The direction is from the external object to the object being investigated perpendicular to their shared contact surface. Box 3 is the friction force. There are two kinds of friction, kinetic and static. Again, keep this visual in mind as you read the description. The friction force is actually based on the electromagnetic force and it's the sticky force between two two objects in physical contact with each other. This is a useful bullet. Friction always opposes motion and is oriented parallel to the contact surface between the two objects. Box 4. Tension is a force that's transmitted via a rope, a string, a cable, etc. Tension can only pull an object. Tension can never push an object. This is a really useful summary diagram. Let's spend a lot of time talking about it. You're looking at a box sliding up a ramp. The first thing I'm going to do is to rotate my coordinate system. This isn't mandatory, but it makes things simpler. If I rotate the coordinate system like you see here, it means I have to decompose fewer vectors. Now I'm going to draw the free body diagram for my box. There is friction, and because there's relative motion between the box and the ramp, it's kinetic friction. As mentioned, kinetic friction always opposes motion. That's why it's oriented down the ramp. This normal force is the Newton's third law reaction force between the ramp and the box. The box is pressing down on the ramp, so the ramp will respond by pushing up on the box perpendicular to their shared contact surface, as you see here. This tension force is transmitted by a string that's connected to a hanging mass via that pulley. Here's the weight force acting on the box. It's pointing straight down towards the center of the earth. 
In this rotated coordinate system, I have only one two-dimensional force, that weight force. That's why you see me decomposing it into X and Y components. The hanging mass that you see here has two forces acting on it. Tension is pulling it up and weight is pulling it down. For this box, I don't need to rotate the coordinate system because it doesn't make anything easier. Here's an entire page dedicated to friction, specifically static friction and kinetic friction. Friction is the sticky force between two two objects in physical contact with each other, friction always opposes motion and is oriented parallel to the contact surface shared by the two objects. That's useful to remember when it comes time to drawing the direction of your friction force vector. The greater the pressing together force, which is the normal force, the greater the stickiness and the greater the friction. Box number one. Of the two types of friction, static friction is the trickiest. If two objects are at rest relative to each other, there's static friction. Here's the tricky thing about static friction, it can grow from zero to some maximum value. It's scalable. So this expression says the maximum static friction force is greater than or equal to zero, but less than or equal to some maximum value, which is given by mu sub s times the normal force. This is Greek letter mu subscript s for static. Mu sub s is the coefficient of static friction. It's a material property. So for example, a concrete surface is a lot stickier than a glass glass surface. So imagine you walk up to a box sitting on your floor in your basement and you start pushing it and it's not moving because there's friction. You keep increasing the force that you're applying to the box and at some point you're going to overcome the friction force and the box will start sliding. At that point you're considering kinetic friction. Kinetic friction always points in the direction opposite to the velocity of the object. I should also mention that the static friction vector always points in the direction opposite to the object's motion tendency. Tendency. If you push on that box in your basement to the right, it's not moving yet, but it's tending to move to the right, so static friction will point in the opposite direction. F sub k equals mu sub k times F sub n. Translating that, the kinetic friction force equals the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force. So we have two coefficients of friction. Mu sub s is the coefficient of static friction. Mu sub k is the coefficient of kinetic friction. They are both material properties but they're different. Mu sub k is typically less than mu sub s and you see that yourself when you push on that box it's hard to get it moving but once you get it moving it seems easier to keep it moving. Okay let's go back to the refrigerator. This time though it's sitting on a rough surface with some friction. When there's no applied force there's no friction. Now watch when I apply a 100 newton force. The refrigerator still doesn't move. That's because static friction woke up and perfectly opposes this applied force. It's scaled from 0 newtons to 100 newtons. If I increase this force to 181 newtons, there's still no motion. But watch now what happens if I use a force of 182 newtons. Finally, the refrigerator moves. This tells me the static friction scaled up to 181 newtons, but that was its limit. From this I can find the coefficient of static friction. Notice as soon as the applied force exceeds 181 newtons, not only does the refrigerator move, but the friction force instantly changes from static to kinetic, and it shows a value of 136 newtons. From this I can find the coefficient of kinetic friction. Okay, let's go through these following nine boxes. If you comprehend everything that follows, you're in really good shape as far as understanding the intricacies of friction. Box A, I apply a force to that wooden block, but it's not moving because of static friction, the stickiness between the wood block and that concrete floor. Box B, I increase my applied force, but notice how the friction vector has also increased. It's still opposite and equal to my applied force, no motion. Box C, I continue to increase the applied applied force, but the static friction force also increases and remains opposite and equal, still no motion. Box D is where everything breaks loose. I increase my applied force, I overcome the static friction force, so now I'm dealing only with kinetic friction. Kinetic friction is typically less than static friction, which is why now this box is not only moving, but it's accelerating as well. Box E, I decrease my applied force, but my kinetic friction vector remains unchanged. I still have a 
net positive force pointing to the right, which is why I still have an acceleration and still have a velocity. The acceleration has diminished, but my velocity continues to increase. Box F, I continue to decrease the applied force. It's now opposite and equal to that of the kinetic friction vector, which means the acceleration is zero and my box moves at a constant velocity. Box G, I'm continuing to decrease the applied force and now it's actually less than the kinetic friction force, which is why I now have a net acceleration going to the left. Whenever I have an acceleration vector pointing in the opposite direction compared to the velocity vector, that's called deceleration and my box is slowing down. Box H, I remove the applied force completely. The only force acting on this box is the kinetic friction force. My deceleration increases and my velocity decreases rapidly. Box I, the box skids to a complete stop and there's no motion whatsoever. Last section, centripetal force and acceleration. Box one, Newton's first law says a moving object moves at a constant speed in a straight line unless a net force acts on it. So if an object is moving along a circular arc, it's because a net force is making it do so. This force is called a centripetal force. A lot of different forces can function like a centripetal force. For example, gravity, friction, tension, and the list goes on. Box two, the centripetal force obeys Newton's second law. So we start with F equals MA and add a subscript C for centripetal. Centripetal means center seeking. We know the expression for centripetal acceleration. We derive that in detail. It's V squared over R. So centripetal force is expressed as F subscript C equals MV squared over R. Box number four. The centripetal acceleration is a vector, so you have to worry about magnitude and direction, and its direction is constantly changing. As the object moves in a circle, its centripetal acceleration vector is constantly moving, so it always is pointing towards the center of the circle or the arc. As mentioned before, with Newton's second law, the direction of the acceleration vector and the force vector are always the same. That's useful to keep in mind. Box number five is saying, what if the speed of this object's circular motion is changing? What if it's speeding up or slowing down? In that case, we don't have uniform circular motion. We have accelerated circular motion. So you see in box six, there's my centripetal acceleration vector pointing towards the center of the circle. My circular motion is undergoing an acceleration as well. So I've added a tangential acceleration vector. Notice that vector is tangent to the circle. And my net acceleration vector is what I get after I do the vector addition between my centripetal and my tangential acceleration vectors. Here's an attempt to categorize basic force analysis. This list could grow or shrink but the aim here is to show you that there's a relatively small number of problem types and it might help you to look for the type of problem that you're solving. I'll finish by returning to the force and torque analysis method. Really commit to using this. This is a very evolved best practice that is very universal and applies to pretty much every type of force analysis situation. It looks pretty scary right now because of all the fine print, but the learning curve isn't that bad and it's definitely worth the effort. Effort. This will make your life easier.